Got it. Okay, well, welcome everybody. It's about a minute after the hour. Uh, my name is Kelly. Uh, and I'm the convener of this, this panel roundtable discussion, exchange of information kind of, uh, exchange of experiences kind of, uh, kind of event. Uh, before I get too deep into some of the other details, one of what the whole idea behind this was to have people sitting around literally in a circle almost, uh, just chatting and talking about their experiences and dealing with, with uh, the COVID pandemic and how that affected their work and how effects could affect the work going forward on, on environmental peace building. This modality using um, uh, Zoom doesn't necessarily make that an easy process, but I hope we can do that. So uh, that's where we're coming from. By the way, in the background, you'll see a, a picture of, of the mountains of, of uh, France, um, Geneva in the foreground mountains in the background, and we'll have a prize later for whoever can find the, the Matterhorn. Um, Good, why don't we go to the next slide. So this, this event and the whole conference, the virtual conference, uh, as you probably all know, has been put on by, uh, through the great efforts of a number of key people, one of whom is one of our panelists, uh, but also with the support of a number of organizations, including the Environmental Law Institute, Geneva Peace Building Platform, Graduate Institute of Geneva, United States Institute of Peace, UN Environment, uh, Martin Dickerson, Charitable Fund, Peace Nexus, the World Bank, uh, the Nelson Tibet Foundation, uh, the Swiss government, and the Wilson Center. So we got everybody there. So it's really thanks to them that originally the conference was going to be free, and it's even more free now. Um, but all the effort and, and work that put, that's gone into it uh, has been supported by these groups. Next slide, please. So you've seen the compliance reminder, I'm sure, in other sessions, and there's a little chat uh, summarized in the chat. Um, as it says, uh, harassment and inform is unacceptable. There will be consequences. Uh, and there are the people you can contact if you feel that, that there have been anything uh, that you consider unacceptable behavior uh, during this e event or any other part of, of the conference. Okay, next. So the panel. Um, you can see them sort of lined up on the right side there, or my right side. Uh, Pavi is from the University of Oulu, or she's now in, I guess, Norway right now, but she can explain that. She'll give herself a little introduction. Pavi, Pavi is with the World Bank, uh, and Daniel's with uh, USAID. And they'll give a little bit of background on themselves when they get to, uh, to speak them. Um, oops, we got taken over by Tracy. There. Anyway, they'll, they'll get a little background on themselves. Um, Uh, the um, I'm laughing because the, the chats pop up in the middle of my screen, so it's kind of a little my attention away from things. The panel, the intent of the panel is to get us thinking and and hear some experiences from from academia in this case, and and from an international financial institution and a, and a donor, a uh, bilateral donor who who've been working on things, uh, peace building and other kinds of things uh, during the pandemic. I had hoped to find somebody who was actually in the field. Um, who had been working under pandemic conditions on peace building, but it turned out to be a little bit more complicated than I thought. Um, and people were a little bit, I think, nervous about being in the field and talking about what they were going through. Uh, so the processes, we'll have some comments from the panel, uh, talk about their, their professional and, and uh, personal experiences, in-person experiences. We'll have some questions uh, that I'll pose to the, the panel, and then we'll open it to discussions and just sort of a sharing of, um, sharing of, of experiences. And so when you speak uh, after the panelists, don't take 45 minutes to explain things. You try to be concise and, and focused on points or pose questions to people or raise questions. Um, because we do want this interchange, but we don't want uh, a situation where we're speaking too much like I am doing right now. So the rule that we have here is the Chatham House rule. Uh, and it basically, as you can read it there, it's okay for people to use comments or use information collected through the session, but they shouldn't attribute it to anyone. And all of us in this meeting are, are in the session are speaking personally. We're not speaking on behalf of our organizations unless we specifically say that. Uh, so I'd like some understanding, I hope for some understanding of uh, participants so that nobody gets too, uh, too anxious about what they're saying, or they should just be careful, or uh, start recording, writing down everything and then put, publishing on the front page of the New York Times. I don't think would happen anyway. 
Good, next slide. Good, okay, that's good enough. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is just turn over to Pavi and, and she can explain her background and, and talk a little bit about her experiences and then we'll go to uh, Phoebe, I guess, and then we'll go to Daniel. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you, uh, Kelly. I'm just taking a second to share uh, my slides with you, which I um, assume that you now can see. Um, uh, of my background, um, so I'm a professor in human geography, and uh, and I do research on climate migration, climate adaptation, natural resource uh, management, uh, often in the global south, especially for the interest of, of this uh, um, uh, roundtable. So uh, field work in 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 Asia and, and Africa, Ghana, Bangladesh, Indonesia, uh, Ethiopia. And I also have a PhDs and I'm mentor for postdocs who uh, do, who come from Latin America, from Europe, from Africa and uh, Asia. And I suppose that's why I'm here today <laughs> to, to talk about how to, how to do research under COVID and what kind of consequences it can have, like personal consequences, and consequences uh, for those that are in different career stages of 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 the well, of their career, but also what kind of consequences it can have for our research. Um, let's see. So um, for myself, I um, I had uh, in. In 2021, I had planned to conduct research in Ghana, Ethiopia, Bangladesh, and Indonesia. And all these um, included extensive data collection in the form of surveys and experiments, uh, often with, with thousand or more respondents. And I, I, actually for one of them, we were just one week off from starting when the COVID hit and everything got postponed and canceled. Um, so basically what happened, they were delayed, they were adapted, funders were understandable, but then again, the challenge is that often these projects, they have uh, money for the salaries, but now what is happening right now is that the salary monies are used up, but we are only now perhaps starting to get the material to be analyzed. So there is kind of a uh, delay in one part of the project, which well has its consequences because basically now I don't have the manpower to analyze the material that we were supposed to uh, analyze. Uh, of course, as you know, there has been the consequences with the meetings, workshops, and networking, all that kept getting canceled, postponed, turned into online ones like this one with its consequences. Uh, for personal life, uh, there has been a lot less travel and uh, a lot more free time with my immediate family. So that definitely has been a positive side. But at the same time, it has been demanding with the home office and lockdowns. I have three kids uh, uh, with ages from five to 15 years. So it has been a challenge, but all in all, I can cope with this. I mean, uh, this doesn't really have a, in the long-term impact on my career. Uh, so, I mean, it's, this is something I can easily live with. But that's not the case for my postdocs and PhDs and even my students. So here I just took a, uh, a screenshot from a, from a blog uh, written by um, Robert Neubecker. So I, I don't know, know him, but what he is um, explaining his blog is, is very much the same that what my PhDs and, and postdocs has gone through. So I had one PhD student uh, uh, in her uh, case country, which is also her native country. He, she left just a couple of months before COVID for the field work, had to stay at the university in the, in the country and, and then never got to go to the field. And stayed for months to end, uh, waiting for the opportunity to go to the field. But that opportunity never came and she had to finally return to Finland. Also, I had the postdoc in, in actually in the same country. It was one week into the field work when she had to 
come back. So, um, <clears throat> So this, of course, has consequences of 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 the research. The uh, they of like have to they have to go for the Plan C. They have to go to Plan D. Um, there are consequences for networking and learning. Meetings don't happen. Workshops don't happen. Conferences do not happen. So what does that do with the learning? What does that do to networking? Some of them we can capture with the online meetings, but not all of them, I think. And for some, even this can have, a, have a consequences for the career, career the stops, the changes, uh, funding runs out, the papers do not get written, and that can have a grave consequences for uh, in career advancement in, in this stage of the career. There is also the social cost. Uh, writing a PhD is awfully a lot of working alone, and it's struggling often. And now even the closest peer group at the university own department has not been there. So uh, it, it has been a struggle. And the, the psychological costs, I don't know, it, I don't think we even know that yet, what these are, but the continu continuous living in the uncertainty, experiencing the stress, the delays, the career changes, the adaptations, the breaks, dealing with expectations. Um, I mean, on top of actually doing PhD, which is a um, very demanding project and time of life uh, in, in, even in, in normal times. Um, then uh, something that I, I, I would like to highlight in this context is it's not only about me and and, and my colleagues or my, my PhD students, postdocs postdoc is also about people whose time we use in our research, with whom we cooperate to generate the knowledge. And I think uh, what we really have, have to think through, and I think this is something that we can also continue and should continue thinking is that the burden that we cause to the people that are living through a prolonged uh, health crisis, with, which has the grave implications for their life and their life prospects, often in, in our field in the context of that is already very demanding. So kind of what research can we do? What kind of extra burden we can cause to people that we do research with or we use in our research? And with that comes to the management of the expectations. So what can we, what can our study partners expect from our, our research? And I, I think these are issues that are always there and we should really carefully think about them. But I think the COVID has put an extra layer, a new layer onto this. And we should really think about these things when, when we plan our research and how, how we do our research when we are out in the field. Um, I, I, I also would like to highlight the kind of the general positive impact that impacts that I see in in the in our research, either my own research or other people's research, because it's of course it hasn't all only been negative, and I will come to the negative a little bit at the end, but I uh, I would like to highlight that. Like, although it has been demanding to come with plan B and C and D for our research, especially when it comes to the data collection fieldwork, uh, this also has made us to innovate. And it has made us to use data sources that are already there. For example, using register data and, 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 and things like that, or existing surveys. But like in my case, where so what I do often in my research, we, we run field experiments and those are designed in such a way that you cannot really replace them with the register data. So that's why all my field work has been basically postponed because we couldn't figure out for our particular research needs uh, and the alternative sources for the, uh, for the data. Um, but I, I would like to highlight the the new ways to collaborate and, and share material that has come with the COVID. 
uh, that involves uh, kind of involving and trusting our local partners and giving them more responsibility, trusting their work, but also importantly, giving, giving them more credit. Uh, of course, there are also the innovative new ways of field access, like online interviews that can be appropriate sometimes and also decrease our carbon footprint and traveling and, and all that, which is in itself is good, but also that we actually have realized that sometimes we can get equally good uh, research material by, for example, using online interviews or online service, all depending on, of course, what we are researching. Sometimes that simply is not possible or would lead to very biased uh, uh, materials to, that we then seek to analyze. I also think that one of the um, positive side has been that for many people, there has been more time to write. And as I mentioned, also use data that already has been collected because there is so much data already collected out there. There are surveys, there are registered data, Afroparameters, household surveys uh, that are not yet fully used. And I think this goes back to the what I was saying already earlier is that it's it's actually our ethical responsibility toward those that whose time has been used to collect this data. We really have to use the data that we collect because otherwise we are misusing people's time if we don't use the material that we actually collect. Um, also, I think uh, another positive side has been that we have, uh, I have had and some people I know, I have a time to update and build their skill sets. Um, the final thing I would like to take up here is that, uh, that when it comes to the lockdowns and uncertainty, fear of not getting paid and uh, fear for the health of our loved ones. And, and for many of us that are living in in, in the more privileged conditions, um, this can and has been a new experience, even an eye-opening experience. And I, I hope and I think that has increased our empathy and understanding toward our respondents or those who we do research with, our participants in the research, because this is often is, is their everyday life, the insecurity, the shocks, the life that they only partially can control. And kind of through the COVID-19, I think some of us have kind of have got the small glimpses of like people's real realities and, and understanding that they actually do ask a lot of them when we go into the field, we interfere with their lives, we ask them the questions, we ask them to think about things that they haven't thought about or perhaps do not want to think about to get our, what our publications, our, our decrease. And to think about like what, what we really should be giving back, how we justify our research and how we justify using people's time. And going back to that, that should then of course mean that whatever material we collect out in the field, we really should use them at some point, at least at the minimum, make them available to other researchers. So post them in the archives so that they are accessible to others. Just a few words and I'm almost done. Uh, the negative impacts on the, on the re research uh, uh, due to COVID-19 that I can see. One of, of course is this access to field. Like when sometimes we really need to go to field in, under, in order to understand the context. We even need access to field in in order to plan the appropriate plan C's and D's. And wh what happens when we don't really have access to peers in, in the form of workshops and, and conferences like, like this conference? What does it do with the quality of our research? And also one thing that I have been wondering is that it's kind of, because, uh, we, have, because we haven't had access to a field often and we have refocused our research, but, what does that mean? Are we then focusing the right things or the wrong things? Because the plan C's and D's are, are they the most relevant research that we should be doing? Uh, are, we, are we doing now something that we, there is less need for? 
is there too much research on the COVID-19? So uh, many people have jumped on the COVID-19 research, but I mean, that comes to expense of some other research. And I, I think these are the things that we need to think through at some point. And the very last thing I, I, I just would like to highlight from my end is that um, when we have had less access to field, that also means that there has been one less watching eye on the field. And, um, and what has had that some consequences are there instances where there is uh, more abuse because even the researchers are not there. And with this word, I, I would like to end my uh, presentation. Thank you all. Thanks a lot. Right, now we can just go to Phoebe. Take it. Thanks a lot, Kelly, and thanks, Pivy. That was very interesting. Um, it's quite different than what I'll talk about, but um, but I think they actually complement each other quite well. Um, my name is Phoebe Spencer. I'm an environmental economist with the World Bank. I'm based in DC, but joining you today from Beirut. And um, I'm going to talk about kind of from the um, international development perspective, sort of um, the things that we've been dealing with around environmental peace building and COVID-19, um, obviously there have been a lot of ways that, that these two spheres have been interacting um, over the past couple of years. Um, it, for instance, it, what's very relevant to our work at the World Bank is um, that the pandemic has actually led to almost 100 million more people being in poverty in 2020 than the previous year. Um, that's a, a huge, um, you know, a huge blow to to um, the development world, really, and and is um, not easily overcome. Um, yet there are lots of things that we can learn from from the kind of processes that we go through in order to deal with this, and in order to try to um, help the people that are are hurting the most during this time. Um, as Pivy pointed out, there are lots of things that are. Um, that are restricted on the ground. So um, one thing that I'll talk about is kind of how we engage stakeholders now um, compared to, to before the pandemic. Um, then I'll kind of zoom out a little and look at um, the way that uh, the people that are often um, very natural resource reliant um, might face degrading uh, natural resource assets due to breakdowns in service delivery or supply chain issues. Um, and then kind of how we can think about addressing COVID-19 and climate change impacts together in order to maximize the impacts of both. Um, so on kind of the, the, I'll start at the smallest and kind of zoom out, but the stakeholder engagement that we do, you know, whether that's speaking to an individual or speaking to a group looks so much different than it did before um, in many settings. And yet um, in, fragile settings, it actually sometimes doesn't look that different um, pre and post pandemic. Um, there have always been challenges um, with stakeholder engagement in fragile settings. And in the World Bank context for a lot of projects, actually, um, there have been so many lessons learned that were, had previously been thought of as stakeholder engagement for fragility. Um, it's now, see, we're seeing that kind of stakeholder engagement for fragility is actually stakeholder engagement for for anyone um, that might not be able to be reached in a traditional way, that might be afraid to gather, or where um, you know uh, where advertising a, a group a group gathering um, might be dangerous, or it might be um, difficult for people, even if you know it means that they have to get childcare or something like that um, in order to attend a traditional stakeholder engagement meeting. Um, those things uh, are barriers that have existed long before before the pandemic and now that um, one of those added barriers is um, you know uh, that people shouldn't or can't gather together um, we're seeing that a lot of these different techniques are actually being used lots of different places and they're not really being relegated anymore to think of to, to being thought of as just kind of for the fragile context um, what's interesting about this is um, so at the World Bank, we have different groups that focus on things like remote supervision. We have um, a group called the Geo Enabling Monitoring and Support Team. So they go by GEMS. Um, they've really focused on the fragility and conflict setting before um, in terms of using geospatial data um, to look at, at kind of different monitoring things. 
which is really obviously very relevant in the context of environmental peace building because we can see changes in environment from the air lots of the time. Um, and this is actually being adopted more and more um, to sort of couple these, um, these kind of from the sky looks at, um, at environment. And you can look, see a lot, more, a lot more than just, you know, changes in tree cover or something from the sky. Um, coupling that with um, ground surveys that are focused maybe mostly on, um, you know, using tablets or using cell phones to collect data and then um, pulling that all together. Um, and of course, in all of these things, we have to um, understand that there's a greater need for cultural interpretation in all of this too. Um, when there's when there's not a traditional setting, um, when groups are being dis, uh, are having discussions separately from each other, you might miss important interactions between them. But these are all things that we can learn from and can continue evolving, um, and that sort of aren't just for um, you know one method for one setting. Um, and it never has been, but now we sort of have extra evidence that that's really the case. Um, phone high frequency phone surveys have also shown that um, they're no longer just used for um, the most fragile places where people can't um, have someone knock on their door and ask them questions. They're actually used it, it much more broadly now. Um, another lesson, though, is that we have to make sure that um, even though uh, sometimes the barriers are lowered for some people, so say that person that couldn't get childcare to go to a stakeholder engagement meeting, they may still face the barrier of not having Wi-Fi or not having cell coverage. Um, and so they may still be left out of, of these new methods too. So um, something to keep in mind um, as, we, as we conduct stakeholder engagement. Um, the second thing moving on kind of from the stakeholder engagement piece that I wanna talk about is widening wealth gap. Um, I mentioned this, this rise in poverty figures uh, but really, it's not just that um, there are more people in poverty, there's actually a widening wealth gap as well. So um, the poor get poorer, the rich get richer, um, both between countries and within countries. And the several World Bank studies have, have found um, that, you know, both these between country inequalities are growing and these within country inequalities are growing. And that's really, really tough um, on the poorest and especially on a natural resource dependent poor. Um, and when this, uh, when this wealth gap is, coup is coupled with sort of the isolation that communities can sometimes face in rural areas, um, uh, from not just, uh, not just from other communities, but from the services that they might be provided by a government, this also creates challenges. Um, and it just continues to widen that wealth gap, really. Um, the World Bank and the UN recently released a joint study, um, a Pathways for Peace study called Inclusive Approaches to Preventing Violent Conflict. And that highlights the role of equitable access to services um, like health, like social protection and education that are really crucial um, to several things, but including um, public trust, um, minimizing fragility and overcoming the pandemic. So all of those things together, they're not just, um, they're not just a kind of a one-stop one shop um, when you provide education or when you, um, you know, when you boost a health system. And um, the people that were facing fragility before the pandemic are actually those that, that need that support, especially, of course. And governments often try to provide such services so that they can kind of help stabilize areas that are in turmoil. Um, but when the service delivery is disrupted, of course, that can really have dire consequences, um, especially if people are really dependent on those. Um, and the, the redirection of, of resources as well, when resources are scarce and they are redirected, for instance, during a pandemic, perhaps toward health, um, other, other sectors, of course, suffer. Um, in terms of uh, having fewer resources for environmental peace building, um, one example that always sticks out to me um, is that um, in protected areas that rely on tourism, when, um, when tourism has dropped, and there's not as much funding, for instance, for um, guarding a protected area, then suddenly that area becomes quite vulnerable to poaching or to um, other types of resource degradation. And then that kind of undermines that, well, tourists aren't going to come back anymore if there's you know, this degraded area. Suddenly there's a whole local economy that depended on that, that now doesn't have um, the same base to rely on, even if the pandemic were to stop tomorrow. Um, so there are these long-term consequences that can really arise through these things. Um, and then finally, you know, I, I feel like um, 
talking about the pandemic invites a lot of um, uh, sort of feelings of hopelessness around this, but there are um, there are opportunities as well, um, and that includes looking at recovery from the pandemic and um, mitigating climate change impacts together as a real opportunity um, to come out of this, um, you know, hopefully stronger. Um, these there are two global disrupt disruptions, both the pandemic and climate change, that play out in the same time in the same space, and that is to say now and everywhere. Um, and the intersection of these has lots of negatives that we see. Um, I mean, the supply chain problems that we see, of course, um, those are really tough for people that are dependent, for instance, on um, raw environmental assets that are being sold sort of as the first step in a manufacturing process. Um, the people selling those raw natural resources, whether that's tropical hardwoods or minerals that are used in electronics, those um, things might be exported um, and the value add for whatever they make a microchip or something, you know, that value add does not uh, does not come to their community, that comes to another community. And when the supply chain breaks down, the community that, that has the raw assets is not, they're not getting anything suddenly. They're not seeing the benefits of a rising price from the scarcity of the final product. They're seeing that they can't sell their raw resource anymore. Um, and this can actually degrade the resources around them if they are then forced to sell off their, their resource for you know, a much lower price or at a much higher rate just to make ends meet, or if they have to switch to a subsistence economy all of a sudden from a market one um, and degrade the assets that, um, that could have been used in a more sustainable way before. And that's assuming that they were used in a sustainable way before. So there are a lot of environmental consequences to this. Um, and of course, at different levels too. Um, in terms of opportunities for positive change at the intersection of, of the pandemic and climate change, um, we can think about leapfrogging innovation. So um, this new report that just came out, COVID-19 and Climate Smart Healthcare, uh, provides a really good example of that where um, lessons from the, the global health response to the pandemic can actually help countries build stronger health systems that are climate smart. So um, this, this report has a framework, for instance, for um, leapfrogging toward climate smart, smart universal health coverage. Um, and that means that suddenly a place that didn't have universal health coverage in the first place um, could actually go from not having a system or having a quite weak system to having a quite strong one that is also climate smart, that is also um, you know, anticipating the needs of a different type of environment that, that might exist around it and that's not contributing to climate change um, in the way that a traditional health system might um, so there are lots of opportunities like that out there. Um, and of course it takes money often and it takes willpower. Um, so those are things to, that are, uh, should not be, um, you know, this should not be glossed over, but um, if there is, if those things are there, there are opportunities. Um, there's also more opportunity for localization and connection with sustainability. Um, the World Bank is, is supporting a lot of countries now with investments um, to restore degraded landscapes and develop climate resilient infrastructure. So um, those are sort of with a longer look forward um, than perhaps a traditional um, development might have been made if, you know, a decade ago. Um, so these are these are ways that, you know, we can kind of think about um, uh, sectors that aren't necessarily sustainable by definition, um, actually making those uh, both um, kind of climate smart and, or at least um, not uh, contributing to climate change, um, uh, you know, making those better at the same time that um, the that big investments under the guise of um, pandemic recovery uh, are being made. So this is it's just a way to address those at the same time. Um, so, you know, I, I will leave it there. I think um, I'm really interested to hear what Daniel has to say, and um, I hope that the discussion can continue further. Thanks. Take it away, Kelly, Daniel. Just, just jump in. All right. Well, thank you all, and um, I think Kelly, you've 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 found a nice order because I really feel like what what I my comments built very nicely over off the the previous speaker. So. Uh, as a point of introduction, um, my name is Daniel Abrahams. I am a 
uh, American Association for the Advancement of Sciences Fellow or AAAS Fellow as Roth called which is a program that places people with scientific backgrounds into the federal government. So I serve at USAID where I am the climate and conflict advisor in the uh, Conflict Prevention uh, and Stabilization Bureau in the Center for Violence Prevention. Um, and, and really appreciate you, Kelly, putting this together. It's a really obviously important topic and uh, do feel regretful that we're not all in person, of course. Um, so I, I'm gonna talk about the challenges to environmental peace building presented by COVID. Uh, from my experiences, primarily at USAID, I'll touch a little bit about some of my academic work, but obviously this, this by no means uh, reflects an, an official USAID position. And I, I also wanna point out that, um, I'm not sure if it's ironic or appropriate, but uh, my perspective on this issue is uh, greatly affected by COVID itself. So I started in August of 2020 at USAID and I'm yet to go to a mission or see a program or step inside our offices. So fortunately I've spent plenty of time doing field work in the past, but the, that, that experience has, has absolutely affected my experience and how uh, I've been thinking about the questions that you posed from the outset, Kelly. Um, with that said, for, for USA, there's a lot of uh, ways in which COVID has affected our environmental work, whether that be defining the problem set or uh, challenging the way that we approach those, those challenges. So for example, things that we're seeing that we're thinking about that have direct impacts on our work is first um, recognizing that there's no clear answer to this yet, that there are reinforcing parallels between uh, deforestation and risks of zoonotic disease spillover. And this is something that we really are trying to think uh, comprehensively about how it relates to our biodiversity work, how it work relates to our health work, how it relates to countering wildlife trafficking. Uh, similarly, we're seeing some preliminary evidence. And again, I think there's still much to sort through that there are areas in which the impacts of the pandemic have ne negatively affected uh, rates of forest loss and degradation as a result of lack of enforcement. Uh, critically, I think we're quite clear, clearly seeing an exacerbation of vulnerabilities uh, leading to decreased food security and resilience and really worrying about the cyclical effects, including the cyclical effects on, on localized conflict outcomes uh, as a result of the pandemic. And, and just thinking broadly, how, how is the pandemic uh, an intersecting factor with other forms of climate change vulnerability? So again, thinking about this in, in, in compound risks. And one example um, where I've done much of my doctoral work, where I did much of my doctoral work, doctoral work I should say, in, in Karamoja, Uganda, where there's a, a rather fragile piece, um, we are getting many reports that the impacts of, of COVID-19 have had far-reaching effects with the closure of livestock markets, um, the uh, diversion of security personnel, really putting some new pressures on some very fragile uh, peace dynamics on, on, on vulnerable systems. But just returning to, to the question informing the panel of how the, the pandemic has affected the policies and practice of environmental peace building, um, it's reflective of a question that we're thinking uh, very purposefully about at AID. So through a, a program that aims to address integrative questions centered on the national environment, we are exploring what impacts COVID has had on, on a broad set of environmental programs with particular emphasis on a number of, of specific missions. And that project has uh, reviewed hundreds of, of program documents, interviewed uh, a few dozen members, of mission staff as well as implementing partners to understand again how has the pandemic affected the trajectory of USAID work. So this is not yet done, so uh, these are preliminary findings, but what we're seeing is uh, direct impact on supply chains that, that have uh, many cascading impacts on programs, that it has made it harder to build rapport both amongst uh, USAID and its partners and USAID and the communities it seeks to serve as well as uh, uh, different communities. And as the other panelists have, have mentioned, it has created some new opportunities that we might not have originally seen. Um, you know, and somewhat sadly, we kicked this off almost two years ago now and uh, would, would think that 
thinking that we would be able to identify lessons from COVID that we would be able to apply uh, afterwards to, to other sets of challenges. But really now we're thinking about how to, how to keep going with this, this, this school of thought. So it, in terms of challenges for um, both licit and illicit supply chain management, uh, as we've all experienced, the pandemic has brought about massive delays in production and in the shipping of goods and materials. Um, these global losses in work and in production has meant that uh, a number of, of folks that are were in the labor market have become unemployed and have started to rely on uh, alternative or different sources of income that they might not have uh, ideally approached. So this has resulted in, in a number of USAID programs um, having to be increasingly concerned with the countering of illegal activities, in particular those targeting natural resources and wildlife. Uh, we've seen several reports that hypothesize that job and material loss in vulnerable communities can lead to um, unsustainable logging, for example, or unsustainable uh, mining, which has in turn created new health and environment and security risks that then again start to cycle up. Uh, so, for example, we've seen uh, reports of uh, illegal slash and burn crop production in Madagascar and an increase in coca production in Peru. Um, similarly, we've also seen a number of programs that have been challenged by uh, not being able to receive or deliver key materials as it relates to, to, to USAID programs. Um, the next issue, and I think it's easy to overlook or, or dismiss it as minor is, is the challenges of building rapport. I think this is especially important as it relates to, to sort of traditional peace building, traditional environmental peace building efforts. With travel restrictions um, and stay at home orders becoming more common, being able to meet physically for training, for community consults, for conferences, for uh, monitoring and evaluation, this, this just became unfeasible. Um, lockdowns kept staff from, from creating relationships with key stakeholders and, and building trust just, just by being there. Um, many programs have effectively canceled or postponed field work entirely. Therefore, we've seen um, programs across the board, across geographies, having to completely rethink how they engage with communities. Um, for some, this has meant going fully virtual with their communication, um, with implementing new protocols and, and working with uh, stakeholders to increase their technological access and their, their comfort with some of the, the virtual formats. But uh, naturally, as I am sure we all can agree with, both the mission staff and the implementing partners and, and participants are, are reporting uh, just fatigue with those virtual interactions. Uh, additionally, from a, a, a DIA perspective and from understanding how particular communities uh, or, or particular demographics within communities become vulnerable, we're seeing uh, uh, new risks come with the shift to virtual. So stakeholders with limited access to online services often cannot easily participate in, in virtual activities and often cannot communicate uh, amongst themselves. So there's been some mission in implementing staff that have worked to uh, address these, these risks and address these shortcomings. Um, for example, during an initial lockdown when there, when there was um, a lack of enforcement um, in particular areas in the Amazon or increased criminality, uh, indigenous leaders in one, in one USAID country created a WhatsApp group with, with an environmental minister which allowed them direct access to a really important decision maker and, and effectively a virtual seat at the table. Um, and similarly, there are examples of how the pandemic has enabled space to address broad challenges that are, that are absolutely critical for resilience. Um, for example, in, in direct response to the challenges of the pandemic, one project that was designed primarily from the perspective of having um, environmental goals aimed to, to increase uh, people's resilience in the Amazon through increasing online access. So it offered small grants and some internet installation 
as well as uh, online learning workshops for indigenous leaders that, that enhance technological skills um, with the goal of allowing um, telemedicine consultations, increasing um, uh, sort of both uh, traditional medicine as well as, as some, some newer forms of medicine in the region. So even if, if the pandemic were to end tomorrow, I think it's important that we would not, in that case, think about this in retrospective terms. These, these what, what is abundantly clear is that the impacts are going to be reverberating. They're going to require new considerations in how we design and implement programs, certainly in the midterm and, and likely in the long term as well. So just, for example, the financial implications for government budgets are, uh, are severe and will continue to be severe as governments are forced to put their money towards health. Um, they are dealing with contractions in cash flows and if uh, history is at all a harbinger will result in less income and less resources and less manpower for uh, environmental programming and efforts around environmental peacefulness. Additionally, uh, with government lockdowns or organizational lockdowns, the ability to protect environmental resources and implement in particular people to people peace building are going to be uh, severely challenged. Um, and in so much as peace building is about building trust with and between communities, time will need to be reinvested uh, to, to bolster those efforts. And finally, I think there's an additional perspective to consider, which is that as the impacts of the pandemic became uh, felt both in economic and, and, and all other terms, many people had no choice but to substitute their, their income um, and to draw upon natural resources, often in ways that were illegal or perhaps uh, culturally frowned upon. And this is going to be a driver of new risks related to resource-related grievances that um, will also require compassion. Um, I was asked when I when I was, sat, was able to sit in on an interview with an implementer, and we asked about the increases in illegality as a result of the pandemic. She kind of froze or shivered for a second because of of the need for that compassion. She stressed that um, there had been disruptions in supply chains, and the loss of income had put many people in a community into a fundamentally survival mode, and and really stressed that a heavy handed response. Um, could drive resentment and inadvertently increase the risks of political violence. Uh, and I personally see that as sort of underscoring the need to consider these dynamics and, and ensuring conflict sensitivity that, that, that COVID is, is effectively a part of, of, of the landscape now, um, whether or not the pandemic somehow uh, goes on much longer or would miraculously just end. So just in conclusion, for USAID, we are still determining what the effects of COVID will be on our efforts. We know in the short term that, that um, the little things that make programs work, for example, distributing cash in person, uh, being there, communicating, uh, working in the spaces of communities, they are going to be hindered. It is going to be a challenge. This, this affects rapport, this affects relationships, and uh, from an environmental peace building perspective, this is, this is a, a major impact. So um, our ability to understand and, and also under, understand the implications of those losses are limited uh, because again, we're, we're not able to be there in ways that we once were. So with, with that, I, I would turn it back to Kelly and, and, and look forward to a conversation. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Daniel, uh, Phoebe and, and Abby. Um, I actually had a question. I was going to pose you a question of what's better or worse and, and what next, but you guys answered that question already. Uh, before we go to sort of a more interchange kind of thing, I, I wanted to actually raise one point that I didn't hear between the three presentations. And this comes out of some work that we were, I've been involved in with the International Association of Impact Assessment. One of the people we were working with on the task force pointed out that uh, a lot of paperwork isn't getting done. <laughs> Because a lot of paperwork for environmental impact assessments or permits or all that stuff that relates to environmental issues and, and you know, community development plans and everything, in many countries is, is paper, it's not electronic. 
And so one of the consequences is that even though people may be filling out the paperwork and sending it to the office, there may be nobody in the office to do the paperwork. And that's going to, that is resulting in a, in a big mound of paper that's going to take a long time to get through. So it's another addition to the, to the balance between you know, people doing things right and, and being able to do things normally. And the fact that even if they submitted all the paperwork, it may be a year or two before they get the answer saying, yes, they can go ahead and do that. And how do they meet their needs and how do they do things in that interim period, I think is, is an interesting, interesting challenge. Good. So what I'd like to do now, thank you very much for your presentations. They're very good. Uh, Tracy has already commented that we actually have a bigger picture here that's developing. I think that's good. What I'd like to do now is just turn this over to anybody who wants to add in their own experiences. I saw something in the chat about uh, from, I think, Bangladesh. Just add in your experiences to complement or, or to, to you know, expand on what other, everybody else is saying, to have a conversation of some fashion. So the easiest way to do that is just raise your hand using the reactions button. And then I'll just call on you and we can, we can go ahead. Or if you want to pose really difficult and challenging questions for the panelists. Don't get too excited. Here. Nobody has any questions. Kelly, can we, can we hear your perspective a little bit? I feel like you're, you know, you've, you've spent so much time working in at the ground level and have a diversity of experience. And, and frankly, I, I, I really value your perspective and uh, would love to hear your thoughts. Okay, a couple of thoughts. One of which is my, my frequent flyer mileage has really zeroed out. I mean, I, I actually have gone overseas. Um, and Daniel's laughing because I used to travel all the time every month I was traveling. But I reflect back, I, it's not actually, technically a conflict situation, but I did actually, I was doing field work in a country at the beginning of the pandemic and we were evac quote unquote evacuated, it was very low key um, because the country was closing down. And we actually continued to do all the work on the project, including five o'clock in the morning, uh, conference calls and trainings and stuff like that. And eventually the donor, not present in this call, agreed to have us go back to myself and a colleague, go back to the country and spend two weeks in quarantine at a beach resort where we couldn't leave our rooms to hold essentially a, a one day meeting with the government to enable them to launch something, a very important document for the government, which as it turns out, uh, because COVID was fairly well under control in the country, we actually had a better attendance at the meeting because not much else was going on at the launch. And so they actually thought one minister would show up and four showed up. And it, it actually turned out to be in terms of the, the, the importance of what we were doing, much had a much higher recognition and a much higher engagement um, because we didn't have a lot of other things going on at the same time in the country. But the fact that the owner was willing to pay us to sit, we didn't get salaries, we just got per diem um, to sit in the hotel room for two weeks. But I mentioned it was on the beach. Uh, so we couldn't go to the beach, we could just look at it. It was kind of a, Difficult thing, but I and we continue to work on, on stuff during that time, and it was easier to call people in the country and talk to them, and you know, it's a lot, much better interaction than waiting, you know, to get up at five o'clock in the morning and do things. But I think that was this, the the donor in this case was making that kind of strategic trade off. They had, they were doing this in other cases for other projects to say, look, if it's really important and gets us to the end point or gets us to a, a critical point, we're willing to invest in just having essentially people sit around for two weeks. Um, to get through the COVID restrictions and stuff like that. Um, unfortunately, the, the day I left, a week later, the day I left, they closed the country again uh, because they had an outbreak of COVID. So it's it's kind of a variable thing. Um, and from a disaster response perspective in a country like Tonga just recently or the Philippines, there is the concept that it's, you know, it's good because it's forcing people to localize and things are being done locally. But in the case of Tonga now, they have had COVID outbreak, not apparently because of the relief assistance. And then they have to shut down in addition to having a tsunami and a volcanic eruption and in the middle of the cyclone season and all these things coming together. So I think some countries in some places, they may just feel like it's, it's just really too much. It's too much happening to them. We've perfected a lot of the remote stuff, but I think as you're all pointing out, we really just don't know how effective that remote stuff is. These kinds of conversations are useful. But how does that turn into something that's productive uh, and useful? Um, yeah, Charlotte was asking, I share something. I, Charlotte Bingham, who's also online, and I have worked with the 
International Association of Impact Assessment. We did three surveys um, over the last year and a half. One of the things that came out of that actually was in the case of people doing impact assessment. So some of this is related to peace building, environmental peace building, uh, environmental compliance, and those kinds of things. Is that there was a lot of adaptation use of drones, satellite, those kinds of things that, that Phoebe, you were talking about within the World Bank. But there's a question about whether the people who are getting that data know what that really tells them. For instance, a single drone, fl drone flight over a wetland, you know, it, okay, it's wet. Um, or a drone flight or imagery indicating that there's new land being developed. Well, why? And a lot of the things come back to what Daniel was talking about is that if you can't get information from somebody eyeballing it on the ground, um, then it becomes very difficult to start pushing to take action about those things, particularly because you may not know even who, who are the actors on the ground doing things. Uh, so the, the difference between a legitimate road construction project and an illegitimate <laughs> mining project may be hard to tell because they may look the same on the satellite, but it's the local government that's justified the local road construction project, but knowing that you know, may be quite difficult. So those are some of the challenges that we've come up from the people who are actually doing, trying to do, continue to do impact assessment. Another one, um, which came from a case of more environmental monitoring rather than the impact assessment ahead of time, was um, you know, the, a management plan was put in place saying you could do these things, and you can't do these things, and you have to do these things. If they do remote monitoring, they don't actually know whether they're being told the right thing. You know, whether somebody's just saying, oh, yeah, yeah, we're doing all these things. <laughs> and if they were to use drones or airplanes or something to collect information, they don't know whether that's actually actionable in a legal sense. Can they actually go back to the people and say, you have to pay because you didn't do the thing three times a week as opposed to once a week, that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of um, bureaucracy that came out of the process of, of just trying to do the normal things. One of the things we've been looking at is how the international financial institutions have have changed how they do things to try to adapt to this. Uh, we want to get those lessons out, uh, out to people. But that's a broader perspective. And I think, but I want to hear from, from some of the others. Charlotte, please, or anybody. Um, I think there was a question in the chat from Tracy. Oh, Tracy, why don't you say something? Hello. Hi. I'm so used to um, I'm so used to putting my questions in the chat. I guess you can call upon me and I can read the question. So um, what I was saying, what I I kind of opined in that I think what worries me most about the work we're doing with each other and in the field and the work that are even you know those in the, just across humanity is the degradation of social capital that comes with not seeing each other face to face. Um, and that we're drawing down social capital by, you know, working um, in WhatsApp or, and not being able to see each other. And so, you know, we're, we're substituting technology and perhaps we're leapfrogging in that regard. But my experience um, is that we don't treat people as kindly <laughs> at, at the worst when we're not meeting in person. And so my, um, my, my own questions about this is, how do we think this is um, affecting environmental peace building works broadly? And I think Daniel touched upon this some. And then um, how can we kind of work to recreate or regain social capital with each other um, in the context of, um, of going on three years of, of, um, of this isolation? Um, uh, and, you know, because I, yeah, I, often I'm mystified by the um, brusqueness of some of the, of just online communications in general, when, um, of course, in, uh, meeting in person, even every once in a while, really helps to establish the humanity in our, in our interactions. Thanks. Uh, I'll turn that over to three panelists, and then if anybody else wants to add in some comments on that, that'd be very useful. Go ahead. I can I can see a few words from kind of from the perspective of, of research and uh, what I find worrying uh, for example my university now is imposing the policy that now that we because we now know that we don't need we can meet online and we can have the meetings conferencing online they want us to restrict travel because now they know that it's not necessary right 
And I, I find that worrying for many reasons. And one of them is what Tracy is talking about is the, is the social capital and how we treat each other and how we build our networks and how we keep in contact with people is that, okay, you can do quite a bit of that online, but it, it requires at least, at least one time seeing the people face to face. Uh, having a dinner together, having a lunch together, having a nice talk, uh, perhaps creating the kids, and that's uh, that's where you base like uh, the social capital. Okay, and after that, yes, uh, routine meetings online. I mean, uh, that's that's convenient. It's uh, it's it's good in many ways, but you cannot really do it very well without first establishing that contact and then building on that in other other means. Um, <clears throat> But then, uh, um, then I, I started to think, okay, what does this um, trust and social capital then mean uh, in, for example, in conflict affected places or vulnerable places where people, not necessarily, I, I, I don't, because for us, we have this kind of luxury that we can isolate us and we can communicate online, but people in, in these spaces, they cannot isolate themselves and they must communicate face to face if they want to communicate. And I, I, I'm not aware of any studies um, who really, uh, that have looked at how the, like, the local social capital has changed because of the COVID-19. Because I can see it can go both ways. It can, it can actually make the communities uh, work together because they can have this common thing that they have to fight, or it can, it can deteriorate. But, I don't know if anybody has looked at that. If, I, I would be very interested to hear about it because me, we had the luxury that we can isolate ourselves and then go over to WhatsApp. But uh, I think many places where we are talking about here, that wasn't an option really for, for many people. So Daniel, if you have any comments on that, Just any more reflection? Sure. Because um, Phoebe, Phoebe is actually someplace else besides where you know they're based. So they got out of the office. I, I am, and actually, it's um, it's very rare. Uh, I'm I'm in a very similar situation as Daniel that I uh, began a new position in um, the fall of 2020, and uh, until this week had not had not left my basically left my apartment um, for work. So. Um, yeah, so so it is very rare, and it um, kind of makes the travel all the more um, exciting and sort of mean, feeling meaningful as well. So I think um, uh, sort of those of us that have been missing it are, you know, when it comes back, it feels um, yeah, it feels different, um, and perhaps like it's sort of precious, the precious thing that could be taken away that we sort of took for granted before. Um, but I think in terms of you know. In terms of environmental peace building, as Tracy was asking about, it's um, you know it can be difficult to. I mean, sometimes if you're working in a place that's that's fragile or in conflict, um, your organization may not allow you to go to those places in, in the first place. So there was already kind of a barrier there. Um, so in that way, you know, from a kind of a, an operational development practitioner point of view, there are, sometimes it's not that different. Um, other than this sort of expectation that um, that everyone is remote and not just your project or not just this instance. Um, but there is there are so many implications to it beyond you know our own personal experiences. And I think about the, you know, in in situations where there there is conflict over scarce resources, there's also this, um, you know, there's there's a lot of um, Kind of maybe more individualistic behavior when there's when things become even scarcer and that you know tension if tensions are already high what's that going to do other than heighten tensions even more and so it certainly doesn't lend any favors to environmental peace building despite maybe the broader you know climate change benefits of people traveling less and um you know those kind of things so um yeah it's it's tough it's um yeah i i I liked this question. It's a very Tracy question, and I mean that as a as a compliment because I think Tracy makes us um, often uh, for for those of us that work with Tracy, she asks these questions to make us reflect on our own work. But then, 
um, you know, it, I'm already seeing more, more things coming up in the comments, more questions and that uh, this, um, you know, it's just make, it's, it's making us reflect more broadly as well beyond our own experience. Yeah, and I'll, I'll answer quickly and I agree with both panelists. Um, I think that, so two examples. So first is I was able to do my first in-person meeting recently uh, or formal in-person meeting and uh, the degree to which we were productive was remarkable. And the fact that we could come to decisions and make eye contact and sort of communicate somewhat normally, uh, it, it uh, really elucidated some of the challenges of, of the work online. But I think from Tracy, your original question, I mean, the, the ability to work with at a ground level, to work with communities and to forge those relationships takes a lot of time. And I think that there's gonna be a sense that we lost that time, that as much as we, people were not able to get to the field that that time was lost and that, that there will be a need to push those efforts. But the sense that I have is that there will have to be some acceptance that, your, that relationships will have to be rebuilt and that the fragility of those relationships, if anything, is going to be heightened. Um, so as we somewhat emerge from the pandemic, uh, just being willing to invest that time and money, even if it's uh, not as immediately fruitful as we need, um, it's kind of where I land on that. And I think, Kelly, you said someone else had their hand up. I'll happily pass it to them. Daniel, thanks a lot. Yeah, uh, Hasib, you wanted to say something? Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, quite uh, fascinating to hearing your experiences. I'm Hasibir Fanula. I'm based in Dhaka, Bangladesh. It is 1 a.m. Uh, of 4th February, so I'm well ahead of you all. Uh, I would like to share three uh, examples from Bangladesh. Uh, one is disaster. Uh, at the beginning of uh, COVID-19, Cyclone Ampan hit Bangladesh uh, on 20th May. It was a fascinating experience because we never, because a cyclone is a quite, quite a regular event in Bangladesh, but maintaining social distancing while getting uh, away from cyclone was an uh, amazing experience, which Bangladesh uh, used its uh, 50 years long uh, cyclone preparedness program to manage that as much as possible. Fortunately, not uh, much uh, devastation took place back then. The second example I would like to talk about is, you know, that almost 1 million Rohingya refugees are now staying in Bangladesh in a very cramped uh, uh, refugee camp. Uh, and once again, um, in COVID-19, at the beginning, we thought that it might be, it could be really, really devastating uh, because social distancing, maintaining them, maintaining hygiene in that uh, uh, water scarce area would be really, really difficult. Uh, but it's still uh, uh, the UN agencies and other partners, they manage, uh, they, they manage to uh, keep the uh, uh, infection as well as mortality down. The third example uh, is about research as we have been hearing. And sometimes I think that uh, priority matters. I can give you a very quick example. Uh, there was a collaboration between an European university and a Bangladeshi university uh, in early 2021. But when uh, it was a PhD work uh, done by a student from the European University, uh, but when the, the infection rate was rising, there was a tension created between the Bangladeshi University and the European University because European University, they wanted to continue the work, keeping the research associates on the ground, but keeping in mind the security of the Bangladeshi researchers, Bangladeshi University wanted to withdraw. So that example actually shows that sometimes our priority uh, matters, uh, uh, which may go beyond the need for maintaining uh, uh, social distancing and uh, other uh, maintaining hygiene condition. Uh, uh, so I wanted to share uh, these three experiences from a different part of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share. Thank you. Uh, I see that's excellent and the idea of the parties to research and projects implementation, ten, having attention about, we wanna go ahead, you don't wanna go ahead, those kinds of things. I think that probably will end up, can end up piloting the power uh, 
tensions that exist between the parties and the funding issues and things like that. Um, as I said, with my own experience where the donor allowed us to go and, and spend time in the field, it was a long process that we got to that point. Uh, and we were voluntarily, we agreed that myself and my colleague agreed to do it. Um, but uh, there was a lot, it wasn't something that happened quickly or easily because the company we were working for also was concerned about that. Um, any other comments or, or, or feedback or experiences um, in the COVID? Daniel, you have something you want to say? Or are you just waving? Oh, no, I was like half, halfway through a sneeze there, Kelly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anybody else have something to add? Um, um, this is Pavy. Um, I just reading Tracy's, um, Tracy's comment uh, saying that. Um, that there is more focus on developing in-country capacity to to lead uh, this work, and and I, I I would like actually to hear more about how how do you do that and uh, what we as the researchers could learn from it because this is um, I do I um, a lot of my research takes place in the global south, but my that's I mean. What I would like to do is to uh, to well, I like to do research there, but what I really like is that uh, that the uh, universities and the partners that I work with there, that after I have been there and doing, for example, a, a project with them once, that after that they will be able to do it themselves, so that it's it's that they, for example, as if like I do experiments, field experiments, so. Uh, it, I would like to go there once, I would like to see it, I would like to learn, I, I need to learn the context, but then I would like to have the local partner to take the front seat and be able to next time run the experiment themselves, come with the design that it's right for that context because they do it better than I can do. I can never do it sitting from in my office in Finland or Norway uh, as good as they can do it because they know the context, they know the needs. Uh, what they sometimes lack is the specific skill, which I hope that when I do it once with them, they can then do it themselves. And of course, I'm happy to support them afterwards, but I would like to change my role in, in that kind of cooperation. And that's why I'm picking on your Tracy, because that seems what you are uh, just suggesting too. So I'm just very interested to hear a little bit more about it. If I can jump in, and I'm sorry that I wasn't on mute um, earlier, I didn't realize that, but um, while I was listening. So, I mean, what I found is that um, if, if any leapfrogging is really occurring, it's that we are uh, really hiring local staff much more quickly um, just because of the logistics of having staff in country. Um, and what and whereas I, I might have traveled somewhere and had local staff or consultants work with me, um, the, our local staff is, is leading, are leading the tasks and I'm kind of backstopping by what's up and, and email and phone calls as well it should be. And um, it might not be 100% of the quality of it might be, that it might be, but if it's 80% and yet there's the learning by doing aspect, it's a great, um, you know, a great move forward in terms of really handing the reins over to in-country leadership who knows the ground situation, knows the people, knows the language. Um, and, um, and I'm just there providing just a bit of guidance in the background. And I think this is huge in terms of um, the fact that, you know, in, in, at least with regards to international development, we've been a, um, and I speak for the World Bank, you know, we've been a Western Washington DC based development institution in our founding. And um, we need to change that. And I think one of the, um, positive impacts of COVID is we're changing that much more rapidly than we um, were um, prior to COVID over. Sorry, I was looking, I wasn't falling asleep. I was looking down at the notes, I was like, 
Uh, any other comments or feedback or suggestions? I, one of the things about the institutional change process is that I suspect there's all this great idea that there's going to be all this institutional change, and then later people are going to figure out, well, maybe we shouldn't really, you know, it's kind of the, the old model of organizations going, oh, we're going to decentralize everything to the field. Oh, no, that's not, we're going to recentralize everything. To the field. I, I'm, I'm kind of wondering whether the, the other wave, the, the return wave is going to come and say, oh, yeah, we've hired all these local staff, but, you know, we, we need to meet 90% rather than 80% and, and things like that. It's a, almost a natural reaction, a little counter reaction that goes on. But I think that initiative is good, although I think as was being pointed out, you know, there's an issue of higher local staff, but they themselves may be uh, seriously constricted as to what they can do. I, I'm working on a project right now where um, it only came up in a conversation that they're all, the, the program staff is all working from home now again, um, again, because uh, COVID, they've had an Omicron outbreak and the corporate strategy is that everybody works from home. So, uh, that this, the localization doesn't necessarily solve the problem of people getting sick or not trying to get, trying not to get sick. Um, good, there was a comment here quickly. Uh, who is it? Jeff, can you explain, you can, uh, <laughs> uh, that's kind of a challenging question. Do you wanna raise that question in terms of the changes that have taken place because of COVID? Uh, I don't know that I'm a COVID expert by any stretch of imagination, but uh, I, yeah, I see in the context of environmental peace building, I think maybe we missed the boat. Maybe we all missed the boat. I think uh, the dependence on the international system, the international trade, I think needs to be reevaluated because if we're in a climate crisis, I would think that localizing uh, products, group, whether it be clothing or food, to be able to produce it within your own country or as close to that country as possible would make sense. Uh, and I think this, the pandemic should have uh, triggered that maybe. And the other thing I think that was a big fail in the pandemic was the, looking at individual health and wellness, as opposed to looking for the magic bullet Deepak Chopra would have called it the magic bullet, you know, where I was looking for a pharmaceutical fix. And uh, I don't know that that's the way to go either. Not that I'm not, I'm not against vaccines, um, but I think the way this one particular rolled out was not like any other. And usually with the vaccine, you have a prevention in getting the disease or whatever it is. And uh, clearly this hasn't happened with COVID. And so I think we need to look at either adjusting the formula of the current vaccine um, so that people, so that we can come up with one that people don't get it. And uh, maybe looking at other alternatives like comorbidities. I don't think they ever really looked at that. I follow a, a public health researcher in New York and she's published lots of stuff on uh, comorbidities people's health. Uh, and a lot of it was censored, actually. Even in Canada, we had, uh, she would put a link in on Instagram, for example, and I would try to click on the link and be redirected to a vaccine promotion thing from the government. So it's, uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of room for improvement on how we can really address the pandemic. Yeah, uh, Jeff, thanks for your comments. Uh, I think one of the issues that I see it from my background in disaster, working in disaster management um, more directly is, is that there are a lot of lessons that had been learned long ago about how to deal with pandemics or endemic epidemics. <laughs> uh, and in some cases, pandemics that didn't seem to get through to the, the process of actually doing things here. We obviously have a major issue with large parts of the world not having access to vaccines. And therefore, as in the case of South, Af South Africa, getting a lot of people getting sick and then that having knock-on effects. Um, and that seems to be where we are actually have this tension. And some, I think one of the comments was from Pavi actually was, you know, we're spending all this time talking about COVID. Are we missing other things? Are we, are we focusing on COVID and us? It's not in a context that I'm, another context I'm working in, the organization 
really it keeps one to do everything it normally does, even having conferences, you know, or planning for conferences and things like that. As if COVID is to be managed by having everybody wear masks and have a vaccine requirement, which is not really the case. And so the idea that we're in the middle of a crisis, and if we can just keep going doing normal things, we'll be able to come to the end of the crisis. It'll be over Tuesday, and then we'll go back to the normal way of doing things. What I'm hearing from the comments here is that some of the, at least the people involved, the, the panelists and others, is that there's a recognition that this isn't going to be something that ends on Tuesday. It's going to be a longer term process, and it's going to result in some significant changes there. Um, but where we know about those, what do we know about those changes is, of course, a, a, a good, a big question. Uh, predicting the future, obviously, is, is quite a challenge. But I'm going to come back to that point. Does anybody else have any comments? In about two, about three minutes. I'm come back to that point. Does anybody else have any comments or input? Well, we're having a conversation. You know, we're we're all standing around, drinking that coffee that they didn't give us, eating those croissants, French, Swiss croissants with the nice chocolate inside, or the pain au chocolat, eating those too fast. You know, well, I gotta stop eating so much, drinking the coffee too fast. Jet lag. I'll, ju I'll jump in just, tr Tracy, sorry that I'm jumping in again, but you know, I, what I just wrote in the chat is, I think one of the silver linings that I just found in Jeff's comments is that COVID has certainly um, challenged and hopefully increased the ability of each country to be, uh, be able to respond to a global crisis on a local level. And, um, you know, hopefully each country involved has learned its lessons about uh, pandemic response, not only, but also disaster response. And just disaster response is um, one of the elements of um, the broader um, environmental peace, peace building which is, you know, how do you, how do you um, diagnose um, what a disaster is, who the, uh, where the immediate impacts will be, how it, how it will um, um, broaden out from the immediate impacts, how to prioritize or triage response, how to crowd in money, um, uh, what needs to be put on the back burner, et cetera, et cetera. And hopefully some of these broader lessons at the country level about how to manage this response will leak over into um, environmental peace building over. That's always the wish uh, that after the disaster, everybody's gonna figure out that they don't wanna do that again. Sometimes that turns out to be the case. Uh, Samuel, you have your hand up. Yeah, th thanks, Charles. So uh, just further to, to Tracy's point there, um, you know, COVID has been, uh, I think, a perhaps not a, a, a unique, but certainly an unusual challenge for the development community in terms of just how um, quickly things shut down, and the extent to which a lot of our activities were suppressed, I mean, even two years in, we're still feeling the effects. Whereas I think a lot of the, the challenges that we traditionally think about in environmental peace building tend to be more localized um, and, and perhaps um, are a little bit more asynchronous in, in terms of when impacts are happening. And so, uh, uh, recognizing that, you know, we've got five minutes left, I can't start too much of a new discussion, but uh, are there things from the COVID experience that are perhaps unique to COVID? And are there lessons from this experience that um, may, may not be able to be applied to the kinds of, you know, whether it's, it's um, transboundary water management or, um, uh, or forestry issues or, or some of the, the more traditional things that, that we talk about, um, uh, you know, what, what care do we want to have in terms of interpreting COVID more broadly to, to these other issues? 
And are we at risk of misinterpreting some of the lessons from this event to future shocks? Very good point. We got four minutes left. Um, I wait, just... a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'd like each of the panelists to quickly answer. You have a minute and a half to answer that. But at the end of your answer, I'd like to, you to tell me where we're going to be in two years. Answer the question and then where will we be in two years? Okay. Uh, uh, I'm not, well, I'm not going to answer the question, but uh, a thought uh, is that uh, pandemic, that was a global, uh, global shock. And what we saw was that uh, development, developed countries took care of their people first. And then they started to take care of, think about others. Climate change is a similar shock shock it's going to hit the whole globe and if there was a learning was the learning then that the developed countries will first take care of themselves so developing countries should build their capability to take care of themselves as well because both are global shocks so when we have other disasters they are usually localized and 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 it's easier to mobilize the humanitarian help for them because it's localized so i i uh, this is, is, I mean, if this is true, uh, well, I, it's probably it's probably kind of negative, <laughs> negative thought, and I'm sorry to end with that one. And in two years, I think we still try to understand what are the medium term and long term consequences of the COVID nineteen. And two years ago, we said that this would be over in six months. So. We don't yet know if this is going to be over in two, two years. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Phoebe. Uh, Phoebe, you want to go next and Daniel? Sure. Um, I thought it was that the, the last question that was posed was very interesting um, to, to pose the question of, are we, are we in over-interpreting COVID in a way? Um, I think it's really interesting to, because that flips the question that often comes up, which is, you know, doesn't COVID um, kind of show us how interlinked so many things in our world and our lives are? It, you know, whether it's because you your Amazon order took took a week longer because of a supply chain issue, or whether you know your um, yeah, you know whether the um, a zoonotic disease can can you know wipe out you know huge chunks of of the population or the economy or um, you know these things have shown in so many ways that that small local level impacts or small local level decisions make huge, huge impacts sometimes. Um, and I think, you know, to me, the the similar or the, the interconnectedness play plays a bigger role in, in my mind and in my kind of narrative around the pandemic than than the disconnect. Um, but it's really interesting to think of it from both ends. As far as two years from now, I have no idea. Um, I don't think any of us do, but um, I do hope that this um, kind of exposure of the inequalities that that have been made worse by the pandemic and that were already existing before it, that the that this is an eye-opening moment. Um, as Pivy pointed out, you know the people in wealthy countries had you know had their governments providing for them quite well, quite early on, and places that could not provide as well for their um, people for any number of reasons, um, there, you know, it resulted in, in suffering. And so, um, you know, the inequalities both within and between countries should not be ignored. And, you know, I hope that this can be a, a sort of a, a turning point. Um, perhaps that's too hopeful, but I'll end on hope. <laughs> um, Thanks. Thanks a lot, Daniel, quick. Okay, really quick. So I'm, I, first of all, hello, Sam, who was, by the way, a co-activity manager on some of the, the work I referenced um, and uh, probably turned to him with that question. But um, yeah, I'm, I, I think both panelists covered it really nicely. I think the central piece that I would point to is just sort of being able to think at multiple scales and understanding that the impacts are, uh, 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 the most vulnerable within a community are going to be as important as the sort of geographic scale impacts. 
Um, as for two years, I don't know. I mean, Kelly, I think, you know, all your experience with, with disaster response is when, when does it become, stop becoming a disaster, right? Like when do you start shifting away from that? And I think we struggle to do that in those contexts. I see no uh, reason to believe that we won't struggle to transition away from this is an emergency to this is something closer to uh, a rebuilding process. And uh, I would like to be more optimistic, but uh, at, at present, I am not. Well, as they say, in two years, we have another chance for a workshop, a little panel discussion about what happened with the pandemic. What pandemic? I don't remember a pandemic. Is there a pandemic? So at the next impact conference in two years, uh, please come back around to this panel. Uh, hopefully I'll have the same people here and uh, we'll be able to, uh, to discuss this, this issue again. I'd like to thank the, panel, thank the panelists for their participation, I'd like to thank the conference, like to thank the conference organizers and uh, everybody else in the group who participated, really appreciate it. We kept some notes and hopefully we'll be able to use this going forward. Have a good conference. Cheers. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.